morning everyone and uh, welcome to our first class in study of uh, first and second timothy titus and uh, philemon um, uh, some interesting books that uh, in the bible that we'll be studying paul's uh, apostle paul's letters to uh, timothy uh, to titus and uh, philemon um, so what is your idea when you think about first and second Timothy? When you think about Titus and Philemon, or what is what comes to your mind when you think about the Paul's, you know, uh, epistles or letters to uh, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon? Any thoughts? Any ideas? Yeah, I'll just share my thoughts. <laughs> I think. Timothy is a book that encouraged me when I was young, when I came to ministry. And uh, we see uh, Paul encouraging Timothy a lot just because you're young. Uh, don't think you can't do it. So that's one of a, a book that I keep always reading when I'm dumb. <laughs> and uh, Titus, I think it talks more about doing good to others and all this. That's what I remember. I think Philemon is a book that most Christians avoid because I think it's just <laughs> one chapter or something, which <laughs> which even I avoided a lot. But I think even that has a lot of things to learn from about. So it's just my thoughts. Thank you, Jeffina. Anyone else would like to share your thoughts on what comes to your mind when you think about First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon? Yes, Lubega. I think the, those four books, I can group them into, first of all, I can say they are all personal books written by Paul to those, four, to those three people. Number two, I can group them into two. One is the, the three are pastor's handbooks, which a pastor or an apostle must go with in order to direct a church. The other one is, uh, the smaller one is like an intercessory book, uh, the one of Philemon, whereby Paul was uh, putting himself in a minor, but almost at the same shoes like the Christ for us as Christians. Okay. I'll pause it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Rubega. Anyone else? Uh, I think more like uh, golden standards for ministers um, where what we, we need to watch out ourselves and uh, so, so many instructions for that and it is really important uh, for people getting into ministry. Okay, thank you, John Paul. Okay, so uh, thank you for your thoughts, your inputs. Um, uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus are often referred to as pastoral uh, epistles because uh, these are letters written by Apostle Paul to individuals, uh, that is Timothy and Titus, rather than specifically to, um, to churches at a specific location as compared to Ephesians, the book of Eph Ephesians, or epistles of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, um, so basically it's uh, written to uh, individuals um, and it's um, then to churches and also it contains uh, instructions and advice on pastoral care okay how to uh, take care of people and also leadership uh, in the christian community leadership in the context of uh, a church so uh, it's more personal letters and of course uh, you know, these letters would be read out to um, the churches as well because it had certain instructions for the church, but more uh, specifically for uh, individuals uh, regarding pastoral care and also uh, church administration. So, you know, if those of you who are interested in becoming pastors, all of you who are already, uh, you know, into a pastoral role or church administration, um, these are good books of the Bible to read and meditate and to um, learn from, which is uh, not just Paul writing in a specific time, 
uh, to a specific um, uh, 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 to specific churches in uh, uh, specific places, but also can uh, minister to us, can also teach us, and we can also follow some of these principles in our churches, in our calling as um, a pastors, and where God has placed us. Okay, so before we um, study um, the first book, First Timothy. Uh, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. So can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Yes, go ahead, Jeffina. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the new subject that you have given us the new semester and as we are learning these episodes god god i just pray that you help us to open our mind and heart and listen to one and apply it in our life god so that uh, we can be a blessing to the people we can lead them towards your kingdom uh, we can be a good shepherd uh, that uh, leads the sheep to the pastures and who searches for the lost ones, God. I just pray that Jesus, every instruction will be inscribed in our heart so that uh, we can live for your glory forever and ever. I give Pastor Selena into your hands. I bless her in the name of Jesus. And I give all my classmates into your hands. Uh, help us to have good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. And may it all be done for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. So um, we'll study um, uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy. Um, so just an introduction to uh, 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 to Tim the book of Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy. Uh, Paul is writing this um, letter to Timothy, uh, whom he has left as an overseer to oversee the churches in a specific place. So which place is that? Any idea? Timothy is overseeing the churches at which place? Ephesus. Ephesus. Ephesus, yes. So Timothy is left, uh, Paul leaves Timothy uh, to oversee the churches at Ephesus. And um, he's uh, writing first and second Timothy to Timothy, who is in this place of, um, uh, of importance of spiritual responsibility, and uh, he's giving him further instructions on, you know, things that uh, needs to uh, be done there, or he's received news back from Timothy. Maybe Timothy has written to him, uh, told him of all the challenges um, that he's facing, the difficulties. Maybe he had questions. Um, and um, hence, Paul is writing to uh, Timothy. Okay. Now, we just look at the, uh, briefly at the background uh, to know how, um, you know, um, uh, Paul and Timothy met. What is the relationship between uh, Paul and Timothy? So any idea uh, when Paul met Timothy and what is the relationship that they share? I think Paul met... Timothy at a place they call Restra with his mother and grandmother. I hear the names of Lewis, I, I mean Eunice, and uh, I don't recall them very well. But he was his father was a Greek, and uh, I remember that Paul took him for, for circumcision because he wanted to minister in, uh, with the Jews. Let me pause it at that. Thank you, Lubega. Anyone else? What's the relationship that Paul shared with Timothy? Okay, Jeffina says spiritual father. It was like his God. Yeah, it was like a, a father-son relationship. Yes, a father-son uh, relationship. Yes, was mentoring him in the father-son relationship. Um, so we'll look at how, um, just like Lubega said, but we look in detail of how uh, Paul uh, meets Timothy. Uh, you know, during his first missionary journey, uh, you know, Paul um, left Antioch. Paul was part of the church at Antioch, uh, which is uh, modern day Syria. And uh, he uh, goes along with Barnabas and they traveled uh, to the regions of Galatia. 
Uh, so Galatia is basically modern day Turkey. Um, and they travel through the cities of Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. Uh, they preach the word of God. They teach uh, God's word in the synagogue, in the in the common place, marketplace, and they establishes they establish churches there uh, in the region of Galatia, that is uh, uh, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. And then uh, you know they travel back to Antioch, from where they began their uh, first missionary journey. Okay, so this happens during uh, AD 44 to AD uh, 46, and we can read about um, uh, this in Acts chapter 13, uh, no, chapter 1, verses Acts chapter 14 uh, to verse 28. Now, this is the first missionary journey of Paul, and uh, uh, during Paul's second missionary journey, which was from AD 49 to AD 52, you know, uh, which uh, lasted about three years. Uh, during this time, uh, you know, Paul and um, uh, uh, his team, they visit, uh, go back to the places that they had gone to during the first missionary journey that is in Galatia. And um, also they go to several places in Asia Minor and Europe, uh, preaching, teaching the word of God, doing mighty signs, miracles and wonders, establishing uh, churches. And then Paul comes back to uh, the regions in, in, in Galatia where he had uh, gone during his first missionary journey. He comes to Derby and then Lystra. And um, <clears throat> Paul notices uh, a very young man, uh, Timothy. Okay, and Timothy had a good reputation um, among uh, the people. You can read this in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 5. Um, uh, so there, were, there might have been many young people in this um, uh, regions, but I think the Holy Spirit uh, specifically causes Paul to notice uh, Timothy and also because of the good report that he um, had. And uh, Timothy must have been uh, about, you know, 17 years of age at that time. And um, uh, Paul notices Timothy and he he identifies, you know, him as somebody who had the potential to do ministry, to be part of his team, uh, uh, a potential leader in the future who, you know, Paul can mentor, can train, uh, can build up in the faith. And so uh, uh, Paul takes on a Timothy, um, just like Lubega said, you know, um, Timothy's father was Greek and his um, mother was uh, 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 Jewish and um, uh, you know the all the believers in that region you know, spoke very well of Timothy that was an added plus point why uh, Paul takes him on but I, I just believe that it's the Holy Spirit just you know speaking to Paul to take him on to nurture and build him because of the calling that God had on uh, Timothy's life and the potential that he had uh, to be a future uh, you know, capable uh, spiritual leader to handle great responsibility. And that's how we see Paul lead, leaving him in a in, in strategic and a very important place uh, like um, Ephesus. Okay, so uh, Paul uh, takes on Timothy and he has him circumcised uh, so that Timothy will be able to uh, minister to the Jews. And we know that uh, during the early days of Paul's ministry, there was this, uh, you know, this whole issue of circumcision of those who were uh, going to minister. They had to be circumcised. But later on, you know, when Paul um, presents it to the council, the Jewish council, the leaders, the apostles, they all unanimously say it's not necessary for them, for those who in ministry to be circumcised. Um, um, and I'm, I'm sure that's the Holy Spirit again leading them in, uh, unanimously to make this uh, decision. But uh, we see that Paul has him circumcised so that, you know, Timothy would be able to minister uh, among the Jews to the Jews because the churches specifically had uh, a great number of uh, Jewish population, uh, those who had become Christians, those who had accepted um, Christ. And we see that Timothy travels along with uh, Paul uh, to minister along with him and to just learn from him. Um, and uh, to observe Paul so that, uh, you know, later on he can uh, take on a greater responsibilities. Okay. Uh, during his second missionary journey, uh, we see, um, you know, uh, Paul just makes a, a brief uh, stop at the seacoast of, uh, seacoast town of Ephesus. 
which is the west coast of uh, modern day Turkey, uh, is, Eph is Ephesus in Paul's time. Uh, and today it's the west coast of uh, modern day Turkey. Uh, so Paul, we see, preaches in the synagogues at, um, uh, in the F at Ephesus, but he does not stay very long at Ephesus um, because of his plan to go to Jerusalem. And so he leaves Aquila and Priscilla, uh, you know, at Ephesus, and he moves on to uh, Jerusalem. But during Paul's third missionary journey, uh, which was between AD 53 to AD 58, uh, Paul comes back to the city of Ephesus and he spends a good three years of his time in um, Ephesus, something that he usually uh, never does, spending so much of time in just one place, you know, but he spends most of his time, um, his third missionary journey in the city, uh, co city of um, um, Ephesus and um, powerful things and wonderful ministry that has been established during his three years here um, at um, Ephesus. Okay, uh, Now, Ephesus was um, a very important city in um, Asia Minor. Uh, uh, it was very, very famous. First of all, it was famous because it was a port city, right? So a lot of uh, 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 trade and commerce that goes on because of the port city. Um, and it was uh, one of the greatest metropolis in Asia Minor. Uh, and it was also famous for this uh, Temple of Diana. The Temple of Diana was very famous in Ephesus. It was one of the largest buildings that existed at that time. Uh, and it was one of the seven wonders of the uh, world. Um, uh, so uh, the, the temple housed the statue of this multi-breast uh, goddess Dinah, uh, which the uh, the people at Ephesus believed, you know, fell from the uh, sky. Okay, so even though it was a very important port city and a lot of com trade and commerce, it was also steeped in a lot of cultic worship, a lot of sexual immorality because of this uh, goddess uh, Dinah, and. Um, I think there was a lot of work that needed to be done in the port city of um, Ephesus. And also witchcraft was uh, kind of very uh, dominant and prominent in this um, place. But even as uh, Paul spends a good three years uh, in this place, you know, uh, powerful uh, things happen uh, in this place. A powerful ministry uh, that, uh, you know, uh, compared to any other place in the Old Testament happens here in um, in Ephesus. You know, unusual miracles take place uh, through Paul uh, and people, uh, you know, are able to see the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Demon-possessed people are delivered and um, you know, there's a big shift in the city from uh, uh, from the practice of witchcraft to people who were in witchcraft who moved to their faith in um, uh, Jesus Christ. So there was a great turning uh, of uh, souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, basically, uh, there was an uh, important event that happened. You know, um, uh, this uh, the seven sons of uh, Kiva, you know, um, um, you know, they tried, uh, they were doing witchcraft and it did not work out. Um, and uh, we see that, you know, um, it was a failed attempt. And because of that, you know, uh, the failed exorcism attempts by the seven sons of Skiva and um, uh, they were beaten black and blue by the uh, by the demons themselves and they ran out naked and this word spread across Ephesus and uh, when people saw this you know uh, many of them into uh, exorcism uh, and witchcraft sorcery all of them turned away from black magic from witchcraft and uh, scrolls of witchcraft that uh, uh, you know worth uh, a lot of money were all burnt up that was a kind of revival that was a powerful change that happened a turn of events that happened uh, in um, the city of um, ephesus uh, and we see that Paul, you know, during his three years, he the first three months he's he preaches in the synagogues at um, uh, at Ephesus, and um, 
uh, there were people who were uh, so hard hearted, who did not believe uh, in Jesus Christ, who spoke evil of um, uh, Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ, and um, you know, um, turned people against Paul. And hence, Paul withdrew from teaching and preaching uh, in the synagogues. And uh, you know, he reasoned or he taught every day in the the school of Tyrannus, the Tyrannus Hall. And uh, he continued ministering here for the rest of the three uh, years. And um, uh, you know, during this uh, time when he was having this so-called Bible school in this uh, uh, hall of Tyrannus, uh, you know, the school of Tyrannus, uh, he trained many future leaders. You know, um, like um, Aristarchus, uh, Secundus, uh, Gaius, Timothy was one of them who he also trained here. Uh, Tychicus, um, uh, Erastus, uh, Philemon, Epaphras. So we see Philemon was from the church of uh, Colossae. He had a church meeting at his home. Epaphras was somebody who went and established the church at um, um, at Colossae. So all of these um, men who later on went on to be prominent, important spiritual leaders, taking on huge responsibilities, uh, you know, uh, were trained in this uh, school. And also, you know, um, Paul raised up many elders and overseers uh, to shepherd or uh, to uh, shepherd the flock, to shepherd the believers at the churches at Ephesus. So uh, we know that during Paul's time, uh, there was not just sp specific church buildings, but there were many house churches. Um, and also, um, you know, uh, theologians tell us that, um, uh, you know, many of them who were part of this school of Tyrannus where Paul was preaching and teaching uh, for almost three years, you know, many of them, along with Paul's co-workers, they went um, uh, throughout Ephesus and the region surrounding um, Ephesus. And, you know, that is uh, that we read in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and uh, chapter 3, uh, the regions along Ephesus, which is uh, Smy uh, Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, Titeria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So all of these seven churches that, you know, are spoken of in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, uh, uh, theologians say that it was these churches that were established during uh, Paul's uh, three-year ministry at Ephesus, where he trained so many leaders, and all of them who were part of this Bible school, you know, went along with uh, Paul's co-workers to the regions along Ephesus, and um, you know, they raised up many churches, they raised up many believers. So all of these seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation and chapter uh, chapter two, verse three. Uh, might have been established during uh, this uh, time. So powerful work was done during these three years. And we see later on towards the end of his uh, third missionary journey, you know, Paul um, on his way to Jerusalem uh, also meets with the elders from the churches at Ephesus, at Miletus. And here Paul delivers a powerful message to the elders. He basically reminds them of, um, you know, of uh, um, uh, false teachers that will come up against them. He's already telling them much in advance. This is nine years before he writes First Timothy. He's already meeting the elders um, uh, during this end of his uh, third missionary journey, and he's telling them how to be careful, how to build a church. And, you know, we see later on, nine years later on, the church was still battling with a lot of false teachers, uh, ravenous wolves that he calls them as, um, but he already speaks to them, he already uh, 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 warns them, he already teaches them, tells them, uh, you know, when he meets them um, uh, the uh, at the militis, the, the elders of the churches at um, um, Ephesus, okay? Now, after his third missionary journey, uh, Paul visits Jerusalem, and Paul... Um, we see he was uh, imprisoned, sent to Caesarea. He was there for two years. And then he's taken to Rome and imprisoned there for another uh, two uh, years. Okay. Um, it was during his, um, uh, after the time of his first Roman imprisonment, that, you know, uh, theologians say that, some theologians say 
you know uh, that um, he goes uh, he he was in house arrest of course not like the second imprisonment where he was not in house arrest so the first imprisonment when he was in house arrest allowed him to meet people and during this time he wrote uh, the prison epistles colossians uh, philemon ephesians and uh, philippians okay now following his first uh, uh, house arrest or his Rome, first Roman imprisonment that is in AD 63 and eight to AD 67 you know Paul uh, takes along with him Titus and I think Timothy they uh, travel to Crete where Paul briefly uh, ministers at Crete and he feels a need um, for a good leader so he leaves back um, Titus at Crete and then Paul um, you know uh, 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 travels along with Timothy to Ephesus and uh, he sees they do uh, some work over there and uh, Paul sees the need for uh, a, a good spiritual leader somebody who is um, uh, capable because Paul has um, you know been uh, burdened about the church at Ephesus and he you know, he already nine years before uh, he travels again and leaves Timothy there at Ephesus. Nine years uh, uh, before itself, he is uh, so burdened that he is he has called all of the uh, elders of the churches Ephesus at Miletus, and he's teaching them. Uh, he's imparting to them. He's telling them about the false teachers, and then maybe may he's gone there and he sees that you know. Uh, things haven't changed it's kind of worsened and there's a lot of church administration that needs to be done excuse me a lot of church administration that needs to be done a lot of things that needs to be followed up and he um, he thought you know it's best to leave somebody a uh, responsible a spiritual leader and who else uh, than Timothy who's been with him all these years who he's mentored he's taught him who's, Timothy has seen his way of life and he thought he's the best person to oversee the churches at Ephesus though Timothy was very young the work responsibility must have been really great very challenging but um, you know, uh, Paul was confident that uh, Timothy would, uh, uh, you know, do what was required there to build the churches at Ephesus. And Paul knew that if he had, if he does not leave a prominent spiritual leader there, you know, the churches of Ephesus would uh, disintegrate in terms of all the false teaching and all the confusion that was ha happening there at um, Ephesus. Okay. Now, Paul uh, leaves Timothy at Ephesus and uh, travels on and then most likely he goes to Macedonia where maybe he hears from Timothy Timothy is feeling the challenge very great maybe Timothy is saying hey Paul I want to come back I'm missing you whatever you know or um, I'm too young for this thing I'm just 30 years and there are uh, leaders who are much older to me how do I tell them what do I tell them there's so much of a uh, problem so um, uh, Paul would have heard about the challenges Timothy might have uh, uh, might be going through or Paul would have read Timothy's letter and hence he feels the importance to encourage Timothy and so he writes first Timothy uh, to Paul who is at Ephesus and Titus who he has left at um, uh, Crete of course during his um, uh, second Roman imprisonment uh, during his last days, uh, he writes his last episode, which is uh, to his beloved son in the faith, that is Second uh, Timothy. Okay. Uh, so Timothy, um, we already have seen a little bit about, uh, just a little bit about Timothy. Uh, you've already heard uh, in the background information that I gave. Uh, Timothy was. Um, no, very young when Paul picked him up was must be 17 18 years old and he's been serving with Paul learning and he might have been 34 years uh, when Paul leaves him in charge of F, uh, at Ephesus so good the number of years that uh, Paul has mentored him taught him uh, Timothy's seen his way Paul's way of life way of doing ministry and so you know uh, 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 
Paul knew it was time for uh, Timothy to take on this challenge. Also, maybe the Holy Spirit's guidance to uh, for Paul to leave uh, uh, Timothy at um, Ephesus. And uh, Ephesus may have been somewhat a headquarters for all of the other churches that were started during Paul's uh, missionary journey. Uh, when he spent a good three years there at Ephesus, you know, uh, the, the, the third missionary journey. Uh, and the churches that were started in Smyrna, Pergamos, Titeria, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and uh, Laodicea. So it was not just uh, the church, the house churches, the many house churches that were meeting at um, at Ephesus that uh, Timothy had to oversee. Not just uh, encounter uh, uh, the false teachers. Not just uh, you know work alongside with the elders that were already there. Uh, or the Jews who were giving, you know, had their own uh, Jewish fables, genealogies, mythologies that they brought into the church, the circumcision that they were trying to uh, bring in uh, and forcing it upon the Gentile believers. Uh, but he also had these other regions surrounding Ephesus. So there's a huge responsibility, a lot of responsibility for this young man, uh, Timothy. Okay. So Paul uh, feels the need to encourage him, and hence he is writing. Uh, first Timothy from uh, uh, Macedonia to Timothy. Okay, so that was um, the introduction to First Timothy. Also briefly, also to Titus, and also very brief uh, for uh, uh, the book of Second Timothy. Any questions? Anyone would like to say anything? Any queries? Any questions you all have? Anything? All of you there with me? Yes, no? We are alive and kicking. We are here. We are here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lubega. Thank you, Zelatoli. Okay. Thank you, Rosalyn. Um, we'll begin uh, our study of First Timothy. Okay. So can somebody please read First uh, Timothy chapter 1, verses 1. Uh, we read verses 1 to 14. Uh, so maybe a couple of you can read, um, uh, or two of you can read seven, seven verses each. First Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandments is love from, from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Thank you, Rosalind. Can someone else read from verses 8 to 14, please? First Timothy chapter 1, verses uh, 8 to 14. But we know that the law is good. <laughs> if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insub subordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, 
according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, uh, Jeffina. So we'll begin our study of um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. So uh, Paul is mentioning his uh, name here. And hence we know uh, it is Paul writing his uh, this letter to Timothy. So he's basically by mentioning his name, Paul is uh, following the letter writing customs of his day. Uh, where first the name of the writer is mentioned and then the name of the reader and then greetings was uh, given, okay? Um, here Paul introduces himself as uh, he does in other letters as well, Paul an apostle, okay? The Greek word for apostle is apostolos. Uh, so what is the meaning of the word apostle? The sent one. The sent one, okay. Uh, somebody who is basically sent with orders, uh, you know, a delegate, uh, we can also say an ambassador, a commissioned one, or a messenger, um, you know, or somebody who's used to call, be called to the office of an apostle, okay. So he is uh, a sent one with. Um, um, in terms of, uh, you know, a function who goes ahead and pioneers the work or advances the kingdom of God. And look at how Paul introduces himself. He says, you know, not just that he's Paul and that he is uh, an apostle, but he says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's Jesus Christ's apostle, which means he's saying, hey, I have been called by Jesus Christ. Okay. I have not just been called by Jesus Christ, but I'm also equipped and I'm also sent forth uh, as his authoritative messenger, as his uh, delegate, as his ambassador. So I am here commissioned by uh, the mighty God, by the almighty God, okay, by God himself. Uh, and um, so Paul, when he says, Paul, an apostle, he's based uh, apostle of Jesus Christ. He's basically saying that I'm an apostle under God's authority. Okay, not just apostle because I choose the title for myself or I love to be an apostle, uh, but that is what I feel I am. But he says I'm an apostle by God's authority. That is what God has called me to be or who God has uh, you know, uh, purposed me to be. So God gave Paul a particular call and a function, and that was to be an apostle, okay? Um, we know that God has gifted each one of us with different gifts, uh, and each of our gifts that God has given is basically for what? The gifts that God has given is for what? Hmm? To glorify him, okay? The gifts God has given us is for what? The different gifts that he's given each one of us is for what? Edification of the church. Edification yes. of the church. Yes, thank you, John Paul, for the mutual edification of the body of Christ and also to glorify God. Okay, so it's important for us to discern, to recognize the gifts uh, that God has given to us, the function that he has called us to in the in the body of Christ, the place of ministry um, to which he has called us, and we need to exercise and use our gifts accordingly, okay? Whatever is our gifts or the offices that God has called us to, uh, you know, we must be totally and completely surrendered uh, to his will and to his authority. Uh, and Paul says that he is not only an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he says, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. So 
he's saying that uh, his calling as an apostle is a command from God. Okay, so ministry is like a command from God. Uh, it's not a matter of our convenience, but it's a command that God has given to us, which he wants us to fulfill. And even as he has given us this calling, even as he's given us this command, he gives us the grace. He gives us the ability, the anointing, the strength uh, to help us to fulfill uh, this command, this calling that he has given us. <coughs> And he says that, uh, you know, he's uh, the commandment of God, uh, by the commandment of God, uh, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. So Paul mentions uh, two persons of the Godhead. Uh, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And here Paul mentions, you know, in these two verses, Paul is mentioning, uh, you know, uh, uh, the P, the persons of the Trinity. He's talking about God the Father, and he's talking about uh, uh, God the uh, 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 the Son, that is uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, so it's important that he uh, he's mentioning all of these because of uh, the doctrinal um, you know uh, problems that the church is going through. So we see that even when Paul writes. You know, very uh, important how he uses his word, he chooses his um, word. So it's important also for us to recognize all of who God is uh, and all that he means to us, not just to know and identify our calling, but also in the process, it is important for us to recognize, you know, who God is and also to know all that he means to us. So here Paul is saying that, you know, he's recognizing who God is. He's saying God our Savior. So he's saying God is our Savior who saved us. He is our Father. He is our hope. He is our Lord. Okay, and we also know that God is our healer, our deliverer, our provider. You know, we can go on and on. So why is it important for us to know who God is? Why do you think Paul is writing in his greetings, God our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope? Why do you think he's, he's mentioning this? To know who we are in, in Christ. To know our real position in Christ. Yes, it's important for us to know who we are in Christ. And here, basically, he's writing this letter to encourage whom? Timothy. Okay? So he's telling him, hey, Timothy, even as I have been called by God to be an apostle, and it's a commandment of God, so he's telling, hey, he's, in, he's telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, actually, you are in that place. You have a calling you know, uh, to be an overseer over the churches. And it's, I know the role is challenging. I know it's difficult, but it's a command of God. Just like for me, as I look at my life, as Paul, he later on uh, talks about it, you know, it, it's it's challenging, it's difficult, uh, difficult, but I'm in this, continuing this role in this position, you know, as an apostle, as a minister of God, because, you know, not when things are convenient, but because the command of God. And so it's he's saying it's important, Timothy, to remind ourselves of who has called us, where he has called us, what he has gifted us with, what he has portioned us, what his purpose for us, and who is he? He is God. And he is God our Savior. So, you know, I think Paul is specifically mentioning God as our Savior because he's trying to remind Timothy, hey, Timothy, I can't save you from the, the ravenous wolves and all of these false uh, teachers and all of these people who are troubling you. I know the difficulties, but God is the one who's put you there. He's your savior. He's not only saved you from your sins, but he is also going to save you from every difficulty and hardship that you are going to face. And he's Lord. You know, he's Lord over your life. He's Lord over your circumstances. He's Lord over your situation. He could have just said, and the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, uh, uh, and Jesus Christ. Why did he mention Lord Jesus Christ? Because he's saying, hey, he is Lord. He is God. He is he's supreme. In his, he's an authority over the place that you are in, you know, and he is your hope. You know, he's the hope in your time of trouble. So I don't know what situations we are in in life, you know, um, 
uh, whether we are uh, in the secular world, we are in the ministry, we are facing challenges, we are facing difficulties. Even if you are a you know just a homemaker, uh, facing different challenges, but it's important to remind yourself the God who has called you, the God who has given you gifts and called you to specific functions. Even as you function as somebody in the church, not necessarily as an as an apostle or a prophet or a missionary or evangelist or a pastor, but you are just you know. Uh, uh, ministering in church as a you know in the prayer team or in the uh, in the welcome team or whatever you're doing but you know need to understand who this God you are uh, serving because it's important for us to be mindful of who we are serving because when we know the nature and attributes of God it helps us to you know follow through in ministry it helps us to continue to run our race uh, otherwise we can you know uh, just give up and uh, you know, because things get challenging, things get difficult. So Paul is basically reminding uh, Timothy here. So I think he's just uh, basically writing to him and saying, hey, God is our savior and he and the Lord Jesus Christ is our, our hope. And then Paul, um, say, uh, you know, is in the following the letter writing customs and he's saying he's writing to whom he is writing this letter. He says, you know, Paul is writing this to Timothy, a true son in the uh, faith so uh, you know paul uh, for for uh, for paul timothy was his son okay who he mentored in the faith uh, and he says true son in the faith and uh, paul uh, mentored timothy um, furthered his spiritual growth and in the service of the uh, lord so they shared a son father son relationship um, because of their common faith in the lord jesus christ no, by using this word common, uh, you know, it's just a basic reminder that um, all of us, uh, what we hold together as uh, a common, all of us as believers, that, you know, uh, we are all common in one thing is our personal faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, which binds us together as a spiritual family you know regardless of uh, our nationality uh, the community that we come from our language um, or even our doctrines that we follow okay which is so important for some of us and so important for the christian community but something that binds us all together one common thing is that we have all personal faith in our lord and savior uh, jesus christ and then paul goes on to you know uh, uh, share greetings and he uses the word grace mercy and peace in his grace in his greeting and um, uh, grace mercy and peace are very typical words that paul uses in his greetings uh because it's an uh it's kind of a blessing in the ancient world in ancient times in paul's time this was a very typical uh greeting or a typical blessing and so he uh, he uses uh, grace, mercy, and peace. And we also see that you know Paul never changes the order of these. He, if you look at most of his letters, he always says grace first, mercy second, and then uh, peace. Because uh, we know that grace is what is grace? Unmerited favor. Thank you, John Paul. Grace is unmerited favor. And, um, you know, unmerited favor of God that is so uh, completely personalized and characterized in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, then peace, you know, um, we know this uh, word peace is portrayed various ways in the New Testament. Um, but peace comes as a result of what? Sorry, peace comes as a result of trusting in, in, in his word, okay? Peace comes as a result of our response of faith to the grace of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, we can experience the peace uh, uh, that God alone can give us, you know, once we have responded by faith to the grace of God that is revealed in uh, Christ Jesus. Okay, so he uses uh, grace, mercy, and uh, peace. 
Okay, it says, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our uh, Savior. Okay, now when Paul uses these words, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, uh, he's basically not just using it as a formality, uh, because Paul knew that the source of grace, mercy, and peace comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our uh, Savior. Okay. So Paul's teaching us that, you know, there can neither be grace nor peace without a personal relationship with God the Father and God the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay. We'll stop here and then we'll continue after the break. Thank you, everyone. See you after the break.